It is a great privilege for me to be given the chance to open up this conference on the doctrine of scripture. I'm honored that name asked me to be a part of it, and I'm humbled that I get to do this alongside many godly men who love God's word and God's people. Some of the other speakers I know personally, while others I only know of through their respective ministries, but I'm excited to see how the Lord will use this conference for his own glory. My name is Erlen Harding. I'm a pastor of Sandefjord Evangelisk Menet in Norway, in Sandefjord, Norway. Uh, and it's, uh, again, a privilege to be part of, the, of this online conference. Let us begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for having provided your holy word to us uh, and for your self-revelation of yourself and for uh, the truths that uh, are in the scriptures. And I thank you for the fact that we can have it in abundance in, in our part of the world. And I pray that you will use this session um, in order to make us uh, more excited about the Bible, more eager students of the scriptures. And I pray that you also use this session to make us uh, uh, more excited about getting to know our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, even better through the study of, of your word. And we pray that you bless the session again. And we pray in your son's name. Amen. The title I've been given for this opening session of this conference is simply Introduction to Scripture. And under this heading, we will look at some elementary and foundational matters regarding Scripture that, while being elementary, remain essential for our understanding and appreciation of the Bible. I don't really expect that I'll say anything tonight that you did not know before, but I hope that I perhaps can remind you of some precious truths and encourage you to remain or have perhaps become, for the first time, a more eager student of the Bible. So we'll look at this topic under a few subheadings. First, we'll look at the source of Scripture before we go to the structure of Scripture, before finally we'll look at the story of Scripture. But let us then begin with the source of Scripture. I've been given instructions to, to try to not steal any thunder from the other speakers that do more specific sessions, but it is simply impossible to not touch on some of the same verses that one or more of the others very likely will look at. So there might be some repetition later on this conference, uh, on some of these passages that we will look at, but I trust that you can all handle to hear some of the same truths twice. Let us then look at the source of scripture. And for that, I want us to look at a somewhat familiar passage from, from 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 9 through 21. So let us read it together. 2 Peter 1, 19 through 21, and I'm reading from the New American Standard. So we have the prophetic word made more sure, to which you do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts. But know this, first of all, that no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men, moved by the Holy Spirit, spoke from God. The background for this passage is quite interesting. Paul is writing to the believers in Asia Minor who are having to deal with problems both from inside and outside of the church. The major external problems for the church was the persecution under Nero, and both First and Second Peter, that is addressed to the same general audience, were letters in which Peter exhorted the Christians in Asia Minor to remain hopeful and steadfast in the midst of suffering and persecution. So the churches experienced what we would call external problems, problems from the outside. But the churches in Asia Minor were facing an even greater danger, an enemy fiercer than Nero, namely the false teachers that were infiltrating the churches. And while Nero offered the imminent threat of physical death, if one was taken by the Roman forces, the false teachers that were offering a more deceptive kind of threat, not of imminent physical death, but of a slow spiritual death for the churches that began accepting what was contradictory to the sound teachings regarding the gospel of Christ. Of course, the situation in Asia Minor at the latter end of the first century is in that sense not very different from the situation in the world today. Certainly, there are geographical differences, but in the western part of the world, where, where we find ourselves, there's an increase in external pressure 
coming against the churches, against Christians. People in the Western world are not yet being used as candlelights as they were under Nero, but godly men and women who speak up for what's true and right have been in jail in many of the countries where we formerly would assume that freedom, freedom of religion was guaranteed. And let's be fair, chances are quite good that the external pressure only get worse in the years and decades to come. But even for us, and I think this is important to be reminded of in this day and age, government is not the biggest threat to the church in the 21st century. The danger from within is much more deadly. Of course, you could speak of the danger from within for all of us, our flesh waging war against a new man, working to make us numb, useless, worldly. But I'm talking about the danger of false teachers from within churches even that preach a different Christ, a false gospel. That same danger that Peter warned about in the late 60s of the first century, that same danger threatens the church today. So whatever words of encouragement Peter had for them certainly applies to us. And in that context, Peter wants to remind the Christians of Asia Minor that God, through his divine power, had granted them everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called them by his own glory and excellence. And more specifically, Peter reminds them of their salvation, the future judgment of the world, and their eternal and heavenly hope. And Peter also reminds and warns the believers about the serious dangers of false prophets. And in the midst of all this, Peter reminds the Christians to remember the source of the scriptures that bear testimony of Christ and the gospel that contain the living hope for the present and the future. First, Peter appeals to his own experience seeing Christ glorified on the Mount of Transfiguration as a certification of his own apostolic testimony. In verse 16 of, chapter, of 2 Peter chapter 1, Peter tells the Christians, We did not follow cleverly devised tales when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from the Father, such an utterance as this was made to him by the majestic glory. This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. And we ourselves heard this utterance made from heaven when we were with them on the holy mountain. Peter reminds the believers of Asia Minor of the fact that he had been there himself witnessing Christ in his glory, being authenticated by the testimony of the Father. And Peter tells them, I was there. I saw it with my own eyes. I'm not making this up. I've seen Christ's power. And trust me, friends, it is much better to be on his side when he is returning. So don't fear Nero, fear Christ. But perhaps more importantly than that, do not lend an ear to any teacher who preaches another Christ than the one Peter saw on that mountain. When I think about that very special event that Peter, James, and John got to witness on that mountain, I cannot help to think, I wish I was there. It would have been awesome in the truest sense of the word, to see our Lord and Savior displayed in his glory in such a way. And the good news is, of course, that we all will get that chance to see him in the future in his glory when he returns. So the opportunity will come again. That's uh, good to know. But still, what an experience it must have been for those three disciples to be on the mountain and behold him in his glory and hear the testimony of the Father. One could perhaps think then, after seeing that, one would never doubt again, never not be faithful again, never go astray. Yet when the time came for Peter to live up to his promise to never forsake Jesus, even if all others did, Peter denied his Savior three times. It wasn't that the revelation of the glorious Christ on the mountain had been insufficient or lacking in any way, but Peter failed when he walked in his own strength, when he failed to keep his eyes focused on Christ, and when he failed to rely on the strength given to him from above. Again, the revelation he received on the mountain was a monumental event in his life. And that is also why he brings it up as evidence of the truthfulness of the message that he had been preaching. But there was another thing that was even more central, more certain, more sure 
in this personal experience of witnessing Christ in his glory. So what was it? Verse 19 of 2 Peter chapter 1. So we have the prophetic word made more sure, to which you do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts. Friends, do you know what's more sure than any experience you will have in your Christian life? The prophetic word, a lamp shining in a dark place, holy scriptures. Sure than witnessing the Christ in his glory on the mountain, more certain than the most ex majestic experience you can imagine. Yes, Peter does appeal both to his own experience and to the prophetic word, but it clearly states that if he had to choose between the two, he would keep the prophetic word and let his experience go. Just today, I saw Spurgeon quoting Luther about this topic just today, and, and, and Spurgeon said that Luther had said the following, I have covenanted with my Lord that he should not send me visions or dreams or even angels. I am content with this gift of the scriptures, which teaches and supplies all that is necessary, both for this life and that which is to come. It was good enough for Peter. It was good enough for Luther. And I trust that it is good enough for you as well. I am very encouraged by the words of Peter. Because that means that in our encounters with the prophetic word, we can have certainty of knowing who God is, of who we are, how it all began, what the meaning of life is, and how it all will end. We can have certainty of knowing God through the revelation given to us in the prophetic word, which is the Bible. And that certainty we can have is, relatively speaking, greater than the certainty we would have had if we had been there with Peter, James, and John on that mountain. So what is it about the prophetic word that is so special? What is it about the Bible that makes it different? In my library, I have a number of books, many different genres, many different titles. All of them, though, have one thing in common. They have the name of the author written somewhere on the cover. They're all man-made. Not so with scripture. What does our passage say? Verse 20. No, this, first of all, no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. All the books on my bookshelf, apart from the Bibles I have, were all made by an act of human will. A human agent, sometimes several of them, several of them made a decision to sit down and write a book about something. Men are the source of the content of those books. But the prophetic word of scripture was never initiated by a human agent. The content of the Bible in one sense is the result of men. Yes, men were involved, but there were men moved by the Holy Spirit that spoke from God. You see, what sets Holy Scripture apart from any other book or written document is the fact that its source is no other than the living God. As I mentioned in my introduction, I'm living in Norway, and in our part of the world, our ancestors used to, to worship the, the gods uh, that are presented in the Norse pagan religions. You might have heard or, or seen them if you've watched any of the Avengers movies. Uh, there's the, the, the god of Thor, there's Odin, Loki, uh, but the, the, there are others as well, the three spinners, and you can go on. Whenever I read Viking history, which is a part of our um, our national history, it seems to be very clear that the men and women that worship these gods very rarely actually knew what their gods desired of them. They had some general rules. They had an honor system. They, in some general sense, knew what was honorable and what was dishonorable, but they very seldom knew if they were pleasing their gods or not. They were looking for omens, a special bird flying in a certain direction, pieces of bones that cast down on a table, and they brought in a seer that had to interpret the outcome of, uh, of something based on the formation of the bones that had been cast. The truth is, though, they had no clue 
They were working on best guesses, assumptions, no certainties about the wills of the gods. We have the prophetic word made more sure. Why is it more sure? Because of the compilation of the prophetic words, which men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. God is the ultimate author of scripture. We can not only know God's will, we can also know God through his self-revelation in the Bible. This living word is God-breathed. It's inspired, it's inerrant, it's true, it's transforming, it's life-giving. And when we consider our role in the history of mankind, we surely must consider ourselves to be among the most blessed with the access to scriptures we all have. Think about the number of Bibles you might have in your own home. If you have a Bible software, you have probably access to hundreds of commentaries. In addition to lexical tools, which can enable you to better deal with the original languages and see the nuances that might not be so easily accessible in your own vernacular. Our access to God's word is second to no previous generation. So let me ask you, is that something you're thankful for? Or is that something you take for granted? Do you take advantage of the fact that you have better access to scripture than any previous generation? I hope you do. Because the scary thing is, we will all be held accountable for both how we invested our time and our passions, but also for the amount of revelation that we've been given. Remember that Jesus chastised this generation for their unbelief. In, remember in Matthew 11, when Jesus addressed the people of Bethsaida and Chorazin, saying that if the same miracles that occurred in their time had occurred in the time of Tyre and Sidon or even Sodom, the people there would have repented and judgment would have been withheld. And Jesus told them that it would be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for the unbelieving generation that had witnessed Jesus' miracles, heard his teaching, and seen his care. They had been given an unparalleled level of revelation and light through the personal revelation of the Messiah, and they will be judged accordingly. What about us? What about you and me? Think about it. Peter tells us that we have been given everything pertaining to life and godliness. None of us can use the excuse we didn't know. None of us can say, no one told us what God thinks about so or so. If you have a Bible and you can read, well, nowadays you don't even have to know how to read because there's apps reading the Bible for you if you can't read. But, but if you have a Bible, if you can read or even listen to someone read it for you, you are accountable for what God has spoken and his word. That's uh, a humbling fact that should make us uh, make us uh, think more about how we invest our time, how we invest our studies. Do we spend time in getting to know God, know his will through the study of scripture? The source of scripture is God. It is really good news that the living God is so different from the all, all the other so-called gods. He's so different from the, the pagan gods of the Norse religions that my forefathers used to worship. While God is inexhaustible in his perfections, he is not mysterious as the ancient pagan gods of my country. God has revealed himself to us through his word. Certainly his majesty and might is also revealed in creation, but in his special, special revelation, he has with clarity and precision told us who we are, who he is, and what must happen for us to be reconciled to him. So let us all be thankful to God for being the source of scripture. Let us be humbled by the fact that our holy God reveals himself to us through his word. And let us be sobered by the level of revelation we have received through the access to scripture that we all have. So God is the source of scripture. Let's briefly look at the structure of scripture. I won't spend too much time on this, but I hope that these very simple observations that I now will make perhaps will awaken us to a problem in our generation regarding scripture that we all have a personal responsibility to do something with for our own Bible knowledge's sake, but also for the sake of our churches. So let's talk about the structure of scripture. The Bible is, as most of you probably are aware of, um, divided into two major sections. You have the Old Testament, written mostly in Hebrew, some in Aramaic, 
covering the historical timeline from creation until almost the 4th century BC. We then have the New Testament written in Greek from the midpoint of the 1st century and until the end of the 1st century. And in between the writing of the two Testaments, that we call the Old Testament and the New Testament, we find the life of Jesus Christ predicted in the Old Testament and recorded in the Gospels and the letters of the New Testament. And both thematically and contextually, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ becomes the hard heart of the Bible and the most important biography of human history. What is often, however, missing in our understanding and appreciation of Scripture is that while the Bible is clearly divided into two, the Old and the New Testament, the Bible is not evenly distributed between both Testaments. It's not a 50-50 split. I do realize that certain genres do contribute to the length of a text, but that does not take away from the fact that about 77% of Holy Scripture is found in the Old Testament, and only about 23% is found in the New. If you take the totality of the Pauline letters, which are perhaps the favorite parts of the Bible to both read and preach from, they only cover about 5% of the Bible. While the first part of the Old Testament, the Torah, Genesis through Deuteronomy, covers about 20% of the Bible. Moses wrote, in other words, four times as much as Paul did. The honest truth, though, is that many Christians, many churches, spend about 90% of their time in scriptures focusing on 5% of the scriptures. And they know only some or very little about the first 77%. And this is where we as Christians do have a responsibility, both for ourselves and for our churches. I guess in, in this day and age, we ought to be thankful if we learn of churches that do preach the Bible in the first place. So even if they, for the most part, stay in only 5% of, of Scripture, praise God if people are reading and, and studying and preaching Paul. After all, he does get it right. He does rely on the Old Testament in his writings. So, so praise God if, if there are churches out there who preach the Bible, even if they just preach Paul. But, but as Christians who want to know God better and to understand his redemptive plan better, can we really be content with not knowing hardly anything about what God is revealing about himself and about humanity from, for example, the prophet of Amos or from the prophets of Jeremiah or Ezekiel? Is it okay if you don't know the difference between Kings and Chronicles? Is it okay if you don't study the Mosaic Law? because we argue that it's something merely related to the people living under the Old Covenant. Listen, when Paul writes to Timothy, 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is inspired by God, profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. What part of the Bible do you think he's first and foremost referring to? He is referring to the Old Testament. Yes, I do realize that he in 1 Timothy 5.18 does equate the writings of Luke with the writings of Moses and saying they're both, they're both part of Holy Scriptures. So I'm not saying that Paul is given the Old Testament a higher standing than the New, but his primary reference in that most famous verse, 2 Timothy 3.16, is the content of the Old Testament. And I think that's abundantly clear from the context of this verse. Because in 2 Timothy 3, 14 and 15, Paul writes the following. You, however, continue in the things you've learned and become convinced of, knowing from whom you've learned them, and that from childhood you have known the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. When Timothy was a child, in his childhood, probably nothing of the New Testament had been penned. So the sacred writings Timothy had known since childhood were the Torah, the law, the prophets, and the writings, which make up the Old Testament. Think about Jesus. In his earthly ministry, he did not write anything. Well, he did write on the sand, I know that. But, but apart from that, you know, he, he did not leave a written document. As a preacher, he was perfectly fine explaining the scriptures at hand the Old Testament. On his way to Emmaus, he gave his follower, followers a Bible lesson. And it says in Luke 24, 27, that beginning with Moses, with all the prophets, he explained to them 
the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. Jesus relied on the Old Testament to reveal who he was. So if 77% of all the Bible is found in the Old Testament, and we know that Jesus used it to explain who he was, and we know that Paul exhorted Timothy to continue in the things that he had learned from childhood from the Old Testament, perhaps we shouldn't be so afraid to spend more time there either. I don't know what the right split should be. Maybe we shouldn't even aim for a 50-50 split, but I think in general, we would all be much better off if we knew our whole Bible better, not just the letters Paul wrote. So please, friends, read the whole Bible, and who knows, you might actually learn something new about God, about yourself, from the Old Testament that you hadn't seen before. And you will be equally transformed by the truths in the Old Testament as you will be by reading the truths in the New Testament. Guaranteed. Finally, then, let us look at the story of Scripture. I already mentioned that the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is at the heart of the Bible. The gospel of Jesus Christ is a salvific truth that all of us need to respond to in order to inherit eternal life. So does that fit in with the story of Scripture? The Bible begins with these very familiar words, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And when creation was completed, God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. But we don't get any further than chapter 3 of Genesis before the first man, Adam, with good help from his wife, is fooled by the devil, talking through a snake. And the man and woman disobey God. They eat from the forbidden fruit from the tree in the garden. And the relationship between God and man, which formerly was characterized by intimacy, as seen by God walking in the garden where man was dwelling, that relationship was now broken. Sin entered the human race, followed by its consequence, death. What had been very good was now broken due to man's disobedience. And God's judgment for man is death. Not immediate physical death, but spiritual death and the start of the physical death process. The snake also gets its judgment. And in the midst of this catastrophe, there is a glimmer of light shining through, seen in the judgment that God gives to the snake. And it's found in Genesis chapter 3, verses 15. Verse 15. This contains this hope. Perhaps not all clear in all of its details, but it's still clear in its hope. God says the following to the, to the snake. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. A future seed of the woman, a man who will be born. He will crush the head of the serpent, but he will do so amidst great pain as the serpent will crush his heel in doing so. The seed of the woman will overcome the serpent's dominion and control, but a huge price of pain and suffering will be paid in order for that to be accomplished. This is sometimes called the proto-gospel, the first time the gospel is presented in the Bible. Not containing all the details, but giving mankind hope that God has a plan of fixing what man has ruined. And men and women living in this age could be saved, trusting God to be, the gra gra to be gracious in providing the means of salvation through the seed of the woman who would come and crush the dominion of the evil one. God promised to bring reconciliation between himself and humanity through the seed of the woman. God had a rescue plan, a plan for salvation. And this rescue plan then becomes the core event of the Bible. God's plan in bringing about a seed from the woman, a man who will come and reconcile mankind to God through his work of salvation. And what is uh, recognized as one of the oldest books of the Bible, the book of Job, we also learn about the work of the seed of the woman, who Job sees as the redeemer who will grant him access to God. In, in Job 19, verses 25 through 27, Job writes, as for me, I know that my Redeemer lives, and at last he will take his stand on the earth. Even after my skin is destroyed, yet from my flesh I shall see God, whom I myself shall behold, 
and whom my eyes will see and not another. One of the few glimmers of hope that Job maintained through his sufferings was the certainty of knowing that his Redeemer lived and that he, after his death, should behold the living God. There was a need, however, of a Redeemer to make that possible. In the Torah, we are introduced to the sacrificial system that illustrates the need for, God, for mankind to have a substitutionary sacrifice to cleanse us from our sins and to keep us in relationship with God. This points forward to the one who would come and be the final and perfect sacrifice who once and for all could reconcile man to God through his blood on the cross, Jesus Christ. Martin Luther said, the Bible is the cradle wherein Christ is laid. He is pointed to in the sacrificial system. He is spoken about through the prophets. The prophets spoke about the man of sorrows who would come and die for his people. Isaiah, speaking about Messiah, says, He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scoring we are healed. Earlier, earlier in his book, Isaiah said these words about the same suffering servant. For a child who will be born to us. A son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. But as Isaiah and others predicted, the promised Savior was rejected by his own people when he came. And the Gospels tell us about Christ, about his perfect life, his death on the cross, and his glorious resurrection, how his own people rejected him, handed him over to the Romans to be crucified, and uh, about how he lovingly went to his own death in order to save all those who believe from their sins. The Gospels tell us how God made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Adam and Eve became unholy, unworthy of living in the Garden of Eden, sinful, not able to remain in the presence of the Lord. The contrast could hardly be bigger to of Jesus, the second Adam, how he's portrayed in the book of Revelation when the heavenly choir says the following about him in Revelation 5.12. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Mm. The same chapter concludes with all the others falling down on their faces, worshiping Jesus. The promised seed of the woman, the promised Savior, came to earth, remained God, fully God, but also became fully man, lived the perfect life, died the substitutionary death on the cross. He reconciled all believers to God through his death so that he could present us, us, sinful us, holy and blameless and beyond reproach before the Father. From beginning to end, the scriptures are centered around the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's focusing in on how an unblemished lamb, Jesus Christ, had to be slain for the sins of his people so that mankind could be reconciled to a holy God through faith in his son, Jesus Christ. I hope you know the story of scripture, and I trust that you believe in the Savior who is presented to us in scripture. And you, if you have not done so yet, my prayer is that you will today, that you will repent of your sins and turn to the Savior, turn to Jesus Christ and believe in him. For all of us, I do hope and pray that our study of scripture, our love for scripture, should drive us into a deeper fellowship with its author, Jesus Christ, into a deeper fellowship with our Savior who purchased us with his own blood in order to reconcile us to God. Let us be thankful for God's love for us revealed in the story of Scripture, which is centered around the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let us all become more eager students of God's word so that we can get to know our Savior better. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for for giving us holy scriptures and we thank you for sending christ 
um, for his uh, life, for his death, for his resurrection. And we thank you for the fact that he will return. And we pray that that day will come soon. And I pray for all who might listen or listen to this this sermon or any other in this conference that they would, if they have not believed in, in Christ yet, that they would do so today. We pray so in your son's name.